In this video, we're going to build an advanced Cycles 4D material to render exposure effects of fire and smoke. We'll bring in the exposure effects data and have it drive our emission strength. We'll then use temperature and the black body node to give our fire a natural color. We'll then repeat the process, but this time for volume scattering and absorption to create our smoke. Lastly, we'll use a flamethrower setup to demonstrate thicker hydrocarbon smoke. Okay, so we're going to be rendering some fire and smoke using Exposure Effects and Cycles 4D. And of course, we need to generate that data from Exposure Effects to pass into a Cycles 4D material. That's what we have at the top here. We have a natural fire and smoke system. If I expand it, you'll see that we have the Exposure Effects object. It has been cached. And then we also have some uh, the sources, which was actually a log pile. And you can see that in the viewport. When I hit play, our cache starts to load in. And you can see we were generating fuel, we were generating heat. That was then mixing, creating the burning effect, which then generates our smoke. It also generates more, more heat as well. So I've actually scouted ahead to a frame that I quite like the look of to work on. That's frame 90. There we go. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with the fire of our fire and smoke or our simulation here. And of course, fire is emissive. It gives off light. So we're going to need to add an emissive shader to a Cycles 4D material. Now, if we go to the Cycles 4D drop down in the materials manager, you'll notice at the bottom we have actually got an XP Explosion Effects uh, menu. And if you need to get going fast and just uh, start working on a scene, just add one of these presets, drop it on your Explosion Effects object. It'll automatically load in those channels and then you can just get going, start tweaking and, and changing the colors there. So that's a great way of getting up and running really quick. However, we're going to build ours up from scratch. And the reason to do that, of course, is to get a good understanding of why we do those things. And it'll help you be able to create your own materials as well. So, of course, I'm going to add that emissive material. And we find the emission shader in the surface menu because, of course, it can be a surface and a volume. So let's drop that in like so. Let's move this over to the right here. And you'll see that the output node the port that is the emission node is piping into is surface. So I want to change that to volume. And you'll see our preview actually even changes. And that's now a volume emission material. Whilst we're here, let's rename this to EFX natural fire and smoke. And when we say natural here in this context, we're talking about the fuel. So of course, we've got these logs, perhaps they were cut down freshly recently. They'd obviously have a lot of moisture in them. They're obviously made up of a lot of carbon as well. And that will actually dictate what our smoke looks like. Of course, we'll get onto that later, but that's just what we're referring to when we say natural. Okay, so let's actually apply this material to our exposure effects object. Let's hit play in the real time preview, and you'll see that we get this big block of volume, this big block of emissive volume. Now, what this actually is, is if we go to the exposure effects object in the display tab, we can actually activate the adaptive bounds. And you can see that's what Cycles 4D is seeing. It's just this adaptive bounds is the, is the volume bounds. And then within that volume bounds, it doesn't really know that there's any data there. It just knows to give it exactly one in every single voxel. So every single voxel is being treated as having a density of one. It's then applying this color. I can actually change the color and you'll see that this is what's driving those voxels. And there we go. And you can see it is volumetric. We are getting sort of a denser or a higher emission value the, the deeper we go into the cube, uh, which is the adaptive bounds here. But it's not what we want. We obviously want this to be our, our fire or our fuel. So in order to bring in data from exposure effects into a Cycles 4D material, we need something called a point density texture node. Now, if we're looking for a node in Cycles 4D, uh, we can get that from the node list. And I have it hidden at the moment, and I'll show why in a second. But if we go to our options in the top left of the node editor window, go to show node list, and then we get this list of nodes, we could just browse for the point density texture node. Now, if I expand the texture list, point density texture is there. I could have just typed it at the top here in the filter, and it would just filter it to the one node, which is very handy. However, like I said, I have this collapsed because I like to use the tab command which just brings up that list wherever your cursor is. And I find that much more convenient. So I'm going to start typing point density texture and let's drag that and drop it into our node editor here, into our material. So 
First things first is that a default point density texture node is set up to bring in XP particle position data. Now we don't want that to happen. We want it to bring in exposure effects data and we can change that with this drop down in the middle. So let's click on that exposure effects and the information we want to bring in is the burn channel. So I'm going to click on burn. Now nothing is happening because we haven't got it connected up to anything. And also I want to turn off some of these options. I don't need the add radius to bounding box. I don't need the normalizing. And also we'll, we'll come back to the uh, linear, which is the interpolation in a, in a second. But if I hit the solo on the density of our, of our point density texture now, we'll actually see some information. And you can see this is actually our fuel channel. So when we say EFX burn in this point density texture, it's actually referring to the fuel channel in Explosure Effects itself. Um, so obviously that's uh, burning is obviously we've got the fire. And so those are in interchangeable in this situation. So I've soloed it out, but what we really want to do is we want it to drive our emission node. So I'm going to unsolo, go back to that large cube volume, and then drop in the density into the strength slot multiplier there. So there we go. We're actually multiplying the strength of the emission shader uh, with the density from our exposure effects simulation, and particularly the fuel and the burn channel, or the fuel burn channel, which is interchangeable. Okay, so you can see that it is quite uh, sort of dim at the moment. So we can actually increase the density of this. We can, once we've brought it in without having to re simulate, we can actually multiply up this density using a math node. So this is a really convenient thing. So I'm going to grab a math node and I'm going to drag that in like so. And I'm going to drag it in between the wires. Now at default, this is set to be a, an add function. So it's just adding 0.5 value to every single voxel. We don't want it to do that. We want to multiply what we already have coming in. So change the function to a multiply and let's change the value to, let's try really high. Let's go for 50 to start with. And you'll see immediately we get a really hot looking volume. And this is how we get that overbrighting, that kind of the way that a, a camera captures fire. If it's overexposing, you get this really bright core of the fire. So I'm going to bring it back down to something a little more subtle, but still 10 times the original value. There we go. That looking really nice. Now, if I zoom into our, or if I actually change our camera and I actually zoom into our fluid, you'll see that, I, that we've got a nice sort of smooth looking fluid. But if I get too close, to the voxels, we can actually start to see the voxels themselves. It's not too obvious here. We are seeing some of it here. However, that's this is what what's happening here is the voxel is actually being blended. It's being interpolated. So between the voxels, we're getting a bit of smoothing going on. And the default interpolation is linear, as you can see over here. It's this uh, drop down on the on the on the bottom of the point density texture node. Now, if I change this to closest. This is essentially just importing the voxels and the voxel data. So essentially up to the bounds of each voxel is exactly the same amount of data. There's no smoothing, there's no sort of softening of that. And we get this really, if we go back far enough, of course, it's actually quite hard to see that. So it's very fast to render that, but we will get these bands and we will get some lines showing. You might not be able to see that, but as the closer you get, the really obvious that this is quite pixelized. Now, this is very similar to image processing where you have bicubic sampling, you have closest, neighbor, and that kind of thing. Whereas this is just, the difference here is that we're dealing with voxels. So we've got an extra dimension versus pixels. So the one we want to actually use is cubic. So if I click on cubic, this is actually going to smooth our, our uh, voxels much nicer. And we can, we can tighten them up later on as well. And there's no evidence of the voxels anymore. And it's just this very smooth looking volume. So that's just something to note that you're going to want to probably change it either from linear to cubic or leave it on linear if that's working. Uh, but generally avoid the closest setting unless you want that voxelized look. Okay, so I've brought in the data here. So we've got our fuel data is coming in. We're multiplying it up by 10. And what we want to do now so we actually want to change where our, our fire is actually being applied, where our actually, actual density is being applied. And we can actually do that using a ramp node, so a color ramp. So I'm going to move this over here, and I'm going to grab a color ramp. 
like so. Drop this in between our, our math multiply and our point density texture. You'll notice that it's connecting up the alpha node to this value. And that's because the type of output here matches the input here. So Cycles 4D is trying to, to helpfully connect them. However, in this case, we actually want to connect up the color. Of course, it's just going to be a black and white value because we're, we're multiplying it here. And what we want to do here is we can actually see that if I change the gradient, if we look at the viewport, as I change the gradient, you can see I'm actually clipping the fluid. So I'm actually clipping out. So up to sort of 50% information, I'm actually removing from our, our render here, even though it's not changing the original simulation, we're just interpolate or interpreting that data. And we're actually remapping it using a gradient here or ramping it. So what I want to do with this actually is I actually want to create a similar look to the fire in the viewport in that the core of the fire, the, the fire closest to the logs is actually quite hollow. It's actually as if the fuel before it's reached its full temperature and we actually get this sort of hollowing effect. So if I zoom in a bit like so, we'll be able to see this a little more clearly. So I'm going to actually bring this one in on the left here. I'm going to bring our white up to the right. So it's going to make it much brighter in this part of the fluid. And then I'm actually going to add another knot. I'm holding con control or command when I grab that. And I'm just going to put this over here like so. And when this clears up, you'll see that we're getting a much more fiery looking uh, fluid there. So it's, it's, it's got that hollowed out look. It's got that much more detail. It's looking really nice. And this is a really good way of bringing in more detail as well. If I really clamp this down and have it really fine here, you'll see we get a much sharper edge, but it's quite unrealistic. Fires don't tend to completely just cut off like that. So you're going to want to have a little bit of softness around the edges and work with that. Okay, so that's actually a really good start for our fire. Of course, we're going to need to work on the color of our fire. It's currently blue. Now, what we're going to do for coloring is we're going to actually use something called the black body node. And I'm just going to add that in uh, on its own. I'm just going to bring these down over here. And let's just add a black body node. So black body. Now, what this does is this actually translates Kelvin values to a temperature on the black body spectrum. And what this is, is obviously, as you heat objects uh, or certain objects up, they go through a color range. And if I actually attach this to our emission, we'll actually see that the temperature here at 1500 Kelvin is this really deep orange. Now the, the minimum is the 800 on this, on this particular node. And you'll see we actually get a pure red when we do that. As I go up through, I'll step up through, you'll see we, we end up getting more desaturated out to the whites. There we go. And then actually, if we go all the way to the 10,000s, it's actually going to get back into a sort of a blue tone. Now, what really colors a flame, it, it's very commonly is this black body spectrum. And it's particles in the flame actually getting to their temperature where they will start emitting that particular wavelength of light. Now, there are other ways to color flames, of course, different chemical luminescences and that kind of thing. But we're just going to be dealing with black body uh, emission here. So I'm just going to set this to 2000 for the moment. And now uh, one thing is, is that this is universal. So this whole flame, the whole burn density or the fuel density is all the same black body temperature. So it's all the same color technically. Now that obviously we're getting different densities of it. So we're getting more sort of brights here and sort of darker areas where it's thinner. However, what we want to do is we actually want to use the temperature of our simulation to drive this black body gradient. Now this is really cool. So what we can do is we can actually bring the temperature in from our, our simulation using the same kind of nodes. So in fact, we want both a ramp. In fact, I'm just going to copy the point density texture that is burn. So it's exactly the it's set up exactly the same, except this time I'm going to change the uh, EFX burn to EFX temperature. Okay. Now, if I solo this, we'll actually see the temperature channel represented. And there we go. It's a lot softer. If I zoom out a little bit, we'll see it nice and clearly. And of course, the temperature is sort of cooling down. It's dissipating as we, we go on. And that's, that's actually in the simulation settings. I'm dissipating the, the temperature. Okay, um, as, as we've got this, 
If I just input this into our black body here and I uncheck the solo, let's see what happens. And we have an extremely red color fire. And the reason for that is that the density, the temperature that is coming out of this point density node is of course zero to one. Now the, the zero to one means that essentially the input into the black body is the minimum it can be, which is that 800. So because of both zero, between zero and one is of course miles off the range that we need, uh, we're going to need to remap that data that's coming out of this density temperature here. So I'm going to actually add a something called a map range node. Now this might look a bit scary. Let's drop that in. And I'll drop it in between our EFX temperature point density texture and uh, our black body shader or black body generator. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the range of temperatures, the zero to one, and we're actually going to map it to that temperature range in the black body. So we're going to start with setting our maximum. So basically when the temperature is one in our simulation, which is sort of an arbitrary number, we're going to map it to the maximum temperature on the black body spectrum that we want. And we want it to be around about 3000 to start with. So let's go for 3000 like so. And hopefully we'll see a change. There we go. And immediately you're seeing that we are now getting a range of colors. Now, obviously that red is pretty extreme because it's, <laughs> it's at the very highest or the very lowest temperature on the black body spectrum. And in reality, what happens is, is that when it's at that color, it's also at a very low power. So it's at a very low brightness level. So the brightness level actually fades off with the black body, but it's not being represented in our, in our simulation here. However, we are getting the range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this lower uh, part of the range to 800, which is the minimum input on that black body range. Okay, so we're still seeing a lot of red, but it's a little, little less aggressive. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down that max value as well to 2400. And we should get a nice range of colors here. And we're getting a lot warmer colors. So the lower the temperature is, the hotter, the redder it'll get, in fact, essentially, the warmer it, the color will get. And so. Uh, what we've got here now is we've got this very red area at the bottom of our of our simulation. And to compensate for that, we actually want to multiply the lower temperatures into our strength. And what I mean by that is if I move this up a little bit further, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the the output of our temperature and I'm going to ramp it. I'm going to give it a color ramp. So let's grab, let's just duplicate this particular color ramp. And what I'm going to do for this one is I'm just going to reset it to default. I'm going to have the temperature go into there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that together with this particular gradient, this particular ramp, like so. Uh, so if I grab another math multiply, so math multiply, let's disconnect that. And let's drop our math down here. Now, of course, <laughs> we've unchecked. So essentially, we're just coloring our voxels now we're not actually multiplying their strength so we get a universal uh, strength but actually the color is coming from a black body still so it looks quite cool but it's not what we want so i'm going to change this to a multiply let's connect this up here and connect this down here and then let's pump that into the the main multiplier the main booster essentially so immediately you'll see that our the bottom part of our simulation here is no longer that really extreme red and that's because I'm essentially clipping out the bottom by multiplying the temperature into the to the burn. Now, it's a little hard to see, but I'm going to actually clip this in even further. And you'll see they're essentially taking out the cooler temperatures are no longer going to be emitting any light at all. So we've got two methods here for remapping or changing the range. We've got the color ramping. And we've got this map range. Now the map range gives us a very specific set of values, whereas the color ramp gives us a bit more of a visually useful uh, and artist friendly way of manipulating our fire. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. It's actually removed the, the really red parts of the flame at the bottom there. And we're getting pretty close to what I would say is a good finished flame. So one last thing is that 
we can we can actually insert a hue saturation value change into this chain just to be able to do minor tweaks drop the saturation perhaps tweak the hue and all sorts of things because this is just color data now so you can treat it like a like a like a, you would an image and you can play around with the pixel colors the pixel values except of course we're dealing with voxels so i'm going to add an hsv node which is hue saturation value i'm going to add it in between our black body and our emission color input and there we go nothing has changed of course because i haven't changed any values now i can actually play with the hue so i could change the hue maybe i want to tweak it a little bit to the right there we're getting a much more yellow flame if i go a bit further we'll get to the greens like so that's obviously a bit too vivid green now of course i'm tweaking it away from its natural colors so i don't want to do that but I might want to drop the saturation down. So if I drop it to like 0.5, that's a bit extreme. But it really depends as well. If we're trying to emulate some kind of camera film, the way that certain films capture color, we, we can uh, apply these saturations and things to the actual fire itself. So I'm just going to drop it down a very slight touch. That's what I, like to, I tend to like to do is just drop it down a little bit. And as you can see, it gives you this very natural looking fire. Okay, so let's just recap. We've brought in our burn, our fuel channel. We've remapped it to give it that kind of hollow look. Uh, we've then multiplied that with our temperature, which then gives us this essentially this masking of our lower temperatures. So we're multiplying this part of our, our gradient, which is the lower temperatures, and we're removing that essentially from our our main strength multiplier, which is our fuel and our fire burning. And we're multiplying those together. Then we're boosting it with this multiplier here, which is just a simple multiplier of 10. And then for the color, we're bringing in that temperature. We are mapping that range to a black body friendly range. We're inputting it into the black body, which then generates that range of nice warm colors. And then we're just slightly dropping the saturation. And there we go. We're getting this nice looking fire. Now, just to demonstrate how versatile this now is, uh, we can actually take this map range and we can actually have it drive a totally different um, node. And that node is the wavelength node. So if I grab wavelength, what the wavelength node does is it essentially allows us to change the color. In fact, if I just input this directly into our HSV and you'll see it's updating shaders and you'll see that our wavelength is set to 500. Now, 500, uh, it's actually referring to the nanometer wavelength, so 500. So if we go down to sort of shorter wavelengths, we're going to be going towards the, the blues and the purples and the ultraviolets. And then if we go back up uh, really high, so sort of 600s, you'll see that we are hitting into the reds. And then if we go too far, we'll get into the infrareds, which of course aren't visible to the simulated eye that we've got in our viewport here or a real-time preview so of course i've just created this this new wavelength object this has a different range to our black body range so what i'm going to do is i'm going to duplicate the map range i'm going to in input value is going to be from our temperature again but instead of mapping it to 800 to 240 i'm actually going to map it to some wavelength values that i know are sort of blue to red so i'm going to say 480 which is a blue to 625 which is a, the red that you're seeing there pretty much so i'm going to actually then input that into our wavelength and we will get an interesting looking simulation so you can see that we're getting these greens where it's cooler and we're getting the red obviously where it's hitting that higher value now we can of course tweak the the input ranges to map exactly where this is on the fluid so i'm going to actually increase this so I want it to be where the temperature is much hotter, like so. That should give us a nicer range. So can you see how we're getting this really nice green sort of spectral look? And of course we can invert this. So I could say, have this at one, this at 0.5. So we're mapping the ranges. So now the lower range is the reds and the higher ranges is the blues. And there we go. So you can see we're getting this really interesting looking flame. So if we're trying to create sort of a magic fire, Perhaps we've thrown something in there that's burning a rather strange chemical. We can use all of these sort of methods to color our, our simulation. 
And of course, we can just straight up color it with a color ramp as well. So let's do that whilst we're demonstrating all the different methods. So let's add a color ramp. And we'll still use the temperature as the input. So I'm going to input that there, like so. And then if I zoom out a bit, just so we can get back down to that HSV, put that into the HSV. And now it's obviously just a black and white flame. But if I load a, a gradient preset, and if I expand that gradient down, load preset, I can just add any of these. So let's add heat, which is quite a, a classic good diagnostic one. And we actually get that spectral gradient again, because of course, that's actually going through the, the spectrum there. Let's grab a rather bizarre looking one. Let's grab the, the, the sort of the test gradient. And there you go, you get a really interesting look. But of course, this has so much control. You can actually color very specific parts of your smoke. Of course, most of it here is being colored by the right hand side of this gradient. Uh, so if we change, if we just add another knot in here, and let's give it a really bright pink color, we should start to see some of that coming in. There we go. A lot of that coming in, in fact. Okay, so I'm going to leave it where I'm going to remove our, I'm going to go back to our black body coloring. Let's delete these wavelength nodes. I just wanted to demonstrate that you can color it in so many different ways. It's very, very versatile. Now, we've created this uh, emission setup here. I'm actually going to group this up. In fact, I'm going to frame this up to make it nice and tidy. Let's put the output all the way up here. And let's frame this. So we've got this in a frame. If you hold Alt and then F, it'll put it into a frame. And there we go. They're nice and tidy. And I can actually rename that if I have it selected. I hit Enter. And we'll call this the flames. And there we go. We have our flames already set up. And what we're going to do next, of course, we're going to move on to our smoke. And I'm going to actually duplicate our point density texture again because it's already set up with our with our nice interpolation and with all the defaults that we don't need turned off. And I'm going to change this from EFX temperature. So I can grab the drop down EFX or exposure effects and then change it to smoke. Now, of course, nothing changes because I'm not outputting this anywhere. But if I solo our density channel, we'll actually get a view of our smoke in the, in the render preview. There we go. So what we're going to do with this smoke, it's a very similar process to our burn, we're actually going to use a color ramp to change the density of it to change the look of it. Uh, we're going to multiply it. But in, instead of it going into an emission shader, it's going to go into both a, a scatter, a volume scatter and a volume absorption. So we'll start with the scatter. And I'm going to add a scatter a volume scattering node like so. Now what scattering is, it's um, Essentially, in the real world, if you imagine the smoke is full of these particles or molecules, and the light comes in, it hits one of those, those molecules, and it scatters off in all sorts of different directions. And of course, depending on what color it's scattering, it cannot actually return a different color to the viewer. So you'll actually end up with a, a blue smoke or an orange smoke. And then also we have an absorption. And I'll actually add that node as well. So we have a volume absorption. And so those molecules, if they're really dark, imagine it's carbon or something like that, it's going to be very dark, and therefore it's going to absorb that light, and it won't actually come back out of the smoke. So with these two nodes, with these, these two volume nodes, scattering and absorption, we can create really realistic looking smoke. So like I said, I'm going to start with the scatter. And I'm just going to run the density into that scatter. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pipe the scatter directly into our volume output. And that's going to take away our emission, we're going to have no more fire. And if I turn the density soloing off, we should now have some scattering. So it doesn't look like much at the moment. However, if I increase this, so let's multiply it. So let's get a math node, do exactly the same as we did before. But this time we are multiplying our smoke. So multiply by 10. In fact, I'm going to go for even more. Let's go for 20. There we go. And there we go. We're starting to get to get this really nice looking thick smoke. And if I rotate the camera around, you'll see that we're getting some shading to it as well. Now, if I really exaggerate this, so if I go to say 200, you'll actually see it scatters so much 
there we actually get some absorption as well. So it's actually scattering so aggressively that we get some darkness on the other side of the smoke. But it's giving it a really nice looking shape. And you can see that this is very promising. So I'm going to actually drop it back down to our, our 20. That's a bit low. Obviously, we don't want the 0.5. Let's drop it to our 20. And what I want to do is I actually really want to thicken a lot of this smoke up, but I, I want to keep the wispiness on the edges. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a ramp. So let's grab a ramp, color ramp, connect it up. Now remember, it connects up the alpha. It tries to be clever, but it actually doesn't work in this scenario. There we go. Okay, so now we've got this color ramp in, we can actually really change the, the exact ranges of where the, the, the smoke is. What I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to just clip a bit of the smoke. Now, if I clip it too much, so if I bring this black knot to the right, essentially, I'm going to clip a lot of the smoke. And you can see it actually gets rid of almost all of it, even if I'm not that far along this ramp. So, of course, we've got t smoke coming in here, smoke density, so zero to one. And of course, if I increase the amount of zero multiplier or, or dark multiplier, I'm actually getting rid of a lot of that sort of middling smoke there. So I'm only going to bring it in a very small amount, sort of maybe 2%. And then what I want to do is I actually want to change this. I'm going to change this to a cubic interpolation. Let's change it to cubic. I'm really going to crank the, uh, the middle knot up to this, this side here. And this should thicken up our smoke quite a lot. There we go. So you can see we're getting that real thickness there. That's looking good. Uh, but now I want to actually bring in that absorption. I want to add the absorption in as well as the scattering. So what we do for this, of course, we need to actually insert the same density. Now we can actually control these separately, but most cases you can actually have the smoke multiplying at the same amount as the Sorry, the scattering multiplying at the same time as the absorption. So I'm multiplying them both by 20. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them together. So what we do is we go add, and then we want to add the add shader. So add shader. This isn't a math node. This is actually a proper shader node. And then I insert the volume absorption. Now at default, you'll see not too much of a difference because our color default here if I go to the HSV, is only 80%. Now, if I go darker, this essentially will, will result in a much darker smoke. And there we go. Now, of course, we're not seeing much color here. And what happens is in natural smokes is that we actually get scattering of the blue wavelengths. And if I test that out here, so let's Let's actually have it reasonably saturated about there and hit OK. And let's see that update. And immediately you're seeing this blue in the scattering, blue in the edges of this smoke. And this is really nice. This gives us a, a really kind of realistic looking smoke. You often see this in sort of tobacco smoke, in wood smokes, that kind of thing. You get as it gets thinner, it scatters the blue light, uh, but at the core of it is quite a warm color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually increase the brightness of that, make sure it's really bright, and I might increase the saturation like so. But I want our absorption to absorb the opposite wavelength there. So I'm going to have it absorb the orange lights, also the warmer colors, I should say. So I'm just going to cheat and grab that color, and then I'm just going to minus 180 degrees. So we actually end up exactly on the opposite side of the color wheel, essentially. So hit OK and see what we get from that. And there we go. Now you're seeing that we're getting this really red core of this, this, this smoke. It's very noxious looking. I mean, that's uh, pretty extreme in terms of uh, the coloring there. So we probably don't want to go that aggressive. So I'm probably going to drop it back down. Let's drop it to, let's drop it to 30% saturation and let's drop the amount down a touch more as well. That should bring it back in. There we go. So this is a really nice preset here or setup for the for natural looking smoke. And that's really it for our smoke. And what we'll do is we'll bring in uh, our emission as well, our fire. But let's first frame this up just like we have with the, the flames. So you just hit Alt and F, hit Enter. 
and we'll call this uh, smoke. And of course, we just need to now add these together. So essentially, we have scattering and absorption added together to create our smoke. And then we've got our temperature and our burn and our fuel combining to color and give the strength of our emission, which gives us our flame. But to combine them all, we just need to add them together with these add shaders. I'm just going to duplicate this one. Just control dragging or command dragging it. And then I'm just going to connect that up like so. And this should now add our fire in to our simulation. And there we go. We have created a fire and smoke shader. And using the principles of uh, the volume scattering, volume absorption, and then also the temperature coloring with the black body gradients and the fuel as the density. And we're remapping, we're changing the ranges, we're multiplying it up to increase the thickness of it, to increase the density. We've created this really complex looking, but actually quite controllable shader. Okay, so now we've actually dealt with this, this natural looking smoke. Let's have a look at it in motion a little bit. Let's just uh, play a few frames. Now, of course, this won't be real time, but it'll update nicely. And you can see if I pause at like an early frame, you'll see that that knocking out the bottom part of the flame has really worked well around the logs here. And you often get that where the fumes are coming off the log, um, the, the, which is actually the fuel that actually ends up burning or the, the, the vapors that burn. And you, you don't actually see much. It looks transparent, almost the fuel. And there we go. As we generate more smoke, it actually picks up and let's scrub to a f much later frame. So 160. And there we go. I've actually got it animating down as well. So you can see here where I've turned the, the, the fire down, we're getting much more smoke. And if we move around so that the camera, the light is behind here, you'll see that we're seeing a lot of the red and the blue fringing here is very nice and very realistic. Now I do have a sky in this scene and it's worth having a look at this with the sky on. I also have a floor, so let's turn those on. So we have a floor, it's just a reflective floor. And then we've got this uh, sky. Now the sky obviously is scattering into our, into our our shader as well here, but we're still seeing this is working nicely in a bright environment as well as a dark environment. And that obviously makes it a really versatile material. Now, one other thing we want to look at is the render settings themselves because they do have an influence on the volume shading. So let's open those up. And you'll see here in the Cycles 4D options at the settings, I've got the integrator and sampling panel open. Now I'm gonna go straight down to this one here. This is volume sampling heterogeneous. Now the volume step size is set to a default of 10. Now, if you want to get more detail in your fluid and you're finding that you're seeing stepping in your fluid, it's very obvious when you see it, but in this case, it's not very particularly obvious. Uh, what you want to do is you want to reduce your volume step size. Now this will allow the cycles 4D engine to actually sample the volume more frequently and therefore you'll have more slices from the camera essentially. What that does mean is that your scattering and your absorption might become thicker. So you might want to watch out for that. You might need to compensate in the material, but just definitely worth noting that the volume step size has an effect on the look. Something else that has a, an effect on the look is in the light paths and ray depth. You'll see that we have this uh, volume steps or ray depth and if I decrease it we're actually going to get a darker fluid because we're scattering less so essentially it's getting a less bounces so much like when you're dealing with glass in any render engine you're going to be creating more bounces to actually get more light into it and that's exactly what this volume uh, depth does and if I increase it a lot we're going to lighten our fluid a lot so if you develop your fluid at the or your, the material, if you develop your material with a, a couple of volume steps, you should be okay. But if you're doing it at volume steps of zero, you might need to tweak the material after you increase them. Okay, so that really covers it there. The only other thing that has a big effect on volumes, especially when it's like bright stuff like fire, is the clamping. So I've currently got this clamped to uh, direct uh, rays, only clamped to a value of five, and indirect to a value of one. Now, if I 
clamp it too hard, our, our fire won't be able to create that really hot look. Um, so essentially, if I go to 0.5, of course, it's going to dim the whole image. But just make sure you have enough room in this clamping. If you're getting rid of noise using the clamping, just be sure, sure not to decrease it too far. Okay, so that's the render settings that affect our volume mostly. And the next thing we're going to look at is actually a slightly different system, but it's using exactly the same concept in the material itself. And you may have noticed the material uh, is sort of spoiled what's coming up, and that's this uh, EFX flamethrower. Now let's turn off our environment and let's actually rotate the light around because I know that this suits better for this scene. So I'm going to rotate that around 90 degrees so it's more front facing. And you can see our natural smoke is now getting front lit a lot more. Uh, but we're going to turn that off. So let's turn that off and hide it. And let's reveal our hydrocarbon smoke. And let's have a look at what we have inside here. So it's another cached out system, but this time we're dealing with a flamethrower. And if I expand that out, you'll see that we have an emitter inside this nozzle of our flamethrower. And if I hit play, hopefully we'll see something. There we go. Our particles are firing out of the nozzle and they are actually our EFX source. So they're adding the fuel and the temperature that's then burning and giving us our smoke. And in this material, our smoke is absorbing a lot of light. So it's high absorption, still got some scattering in it to give it that nice scattering look. And if I hit pause on this frame, let's try that. Let it develop a bit. In fact, let's go into the camera that's front facing. There we go. So you can see if I click on the material, the EFX flamethrower material, we have a pretty similar setup. We have the smoke at the top here. And then if I go down, it's being added. So the smoke is being added to this uh, fire down here. Now the fire is, is pretty much the same setup as we have in our natural fire and smoke material. You can see we're bringing in the burn channel, the, the fuel. We're then ramping that fuel. We're multiplying it a little bit, only by two there. That goes into the strength of our emission shader. And then the temperature is driving, again, a, a black body mapped range. And also that's actually being clamped. We're using the temperature to clamp out the lowest values as well. So it's a slightly different setup, but the overall result is, is very similar. So let's actually take a look at the scattering and the absorption because that's slightly different here as well. So you can see I've got a multiply. So if I take a look at these, you'll see we have a multiply for each of the volume nodes, the volume shaders. We've got a 30 multiplier going into scatter and then into absorption we have a huge 400 times going into that and the color that they are scattering and absorbing actually comes from a single rgb node uh, which has a very um, desaturated blue color that it's scattering and then i'm actually inverting that color which makes it dark remember because we're inverting it and that then goes into the volume absorption but it also makes it quite warm so that's why we're getting this really warm parts in pretty much all parts of the fluid, all parts of the smoke. It's as if in real life, where you have carbon inside the smoke, like elemental carbon, it's going to absorb a lot of the light. And in natural smokes that have a lot of moisture in them, obviously you're getting water and carbon in that smoke. Now, obviously, the more water you have, the lighter that, that smoke is going to look. And the more carbon you have, the darker it's going to look. And hydrocarbons, like petrols, gas, fuels, those kind of things, have very heavy molecules and they generate a large amount of soot, a large amount of black carbon that absorbs the light. And there we go. That's why we have this dark looking smoke in this scenario. Of course, this would work for explosions as well. And because this is automated essentially we apply this material to any exposure effects object that has these channels active and calculates them that will work on there and to prove that i'll actually drag our natural smoke onto the flamethrower like so it'll look a little strange of course but it'll work and there we go so you can see our flame looks very interesting here it's actually quite cool and the smoke is very light compared to our our hydrocarbon flamethrower smoke. Now, of course, we could tweak that so we could go into our natural smoke material and we could multiply our absorption. Uh, we could actually just make our absorption simply a lot darker. 
and it'll give us a different look. Uh, now we're still scattering quite a lot here as well, remember? So we need to tweak that as well. We'd need to perhaps multiply them up. But you can see that just with one material, you can actually adapt it for almost any scenario involving fire and smoke. Of course, we can change the color of that fire, the color of that smoke. This could be a magic or a, a different chemical that we're burning here. So it actually the flame is green or blue, anything like that. And it makes this, these kind of shaders really versatile. Now I'm going to undo those steps just so that we've got our material back to default. And I'm going to put our flamethrower back on here. And we'll just scrub a few more frames. Now if I could jump ahead, you'll see we have a, it actually is a quite a cool sim. It fills up the, this container, this box. And you'll see as it hits the size of the container, we're getting this. We're obviously getting quite a lot of scattering on this front face because that's where a lot of the light is. But then immediately it's, a, it's getting absorbed. So it's very thick. There we go. Let's scrub along a little bit further. And you'll see the shadow it's casting as well is also the same color as the edges that it's scattering. And that's something important as well. That's a very uh, realistic uh, um, effect. We're scattering away the, uh, or sorry, we're absorbing away the blues and we're leaving the oranges as it gets through the other side of the smoke, which of course means that it colors the shadow in that orangey color. Okay, so what we would do now is we can render these out and then in comp, I will just add some uh, slight glows and a little bit of sharpening. But we could also add the glows in the cameras in our scene here by just adding a cycles camera tag. So if we right click and we go to add a cycles 4D camera tag, and you'll see we have post effects. Post effects is what we're looking for. Now, the bloom threshold, if I get to a point where we have a lot of the, the, the fire in the scene, let's just make sure it's showing a lot of that. And if I look at the bloom here and I activate it, you'll see it's extremely bright and also it's picking up a lot of this background here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase that bloom threshold until it's only picking up the really bright parts of our scene. And of course, this is positive. This is above one because it's emitting. So we can actually have our threshold quite high and we know that the, the orange part is what's going to be glowing. So there we go. That's a nice way of giving it some nice bloom. But I tend to always do those in post.